So I'm always flooded with a ton of questions about how me and my mum set about renovating our house into a 1940s inspired dream home. And today I'm going to talk about it. So it was 2016 when mine and my mum's life changed forever and as with many stories this one starts with some life-changing moments. We'd had a rough couple of years, my mum was going through a cancer diagnosis and we were also suffering a devastating bereavement when my best friend in the entire world, my grandpa, passed away suddenly during my university studies and to add to our woes our landlord of the rental property we were living in decided suddenly that he wanted to sell it to his daughter who was moving from India back to England and so amongst everything else we were now homeless. But to help you understand the significance of this story I need to talk about my mum for a sec because she is the single most inspirational woman I have ever known. She uh, had me unplanned in her 20s, out of wedlock, in a strict Catholic household, but maybe that's a story for another day. And she raised me as a single parent and rented her entire life, talking to debt collectors on the regular and living in her overdraft. But every single house we lived in, she would still make it special and decorate it with her vintage tastes. And because of her and also my grandparents, I felt like I never wanted for anything and my childhood was genuinely magical. It didn't matter what kind of house we moved into, everyone felt like a safe haven where I could play and imagine and just worry about being a kid, which I know makes me very lucky. But don't get me wrong, it wasn't perfect. Me and my mum have been through so much together, I sometimes wonder how we are still standing. And after everything we'd gone through, uh, we were living with my nan because, as I said, we were now homeless. And I decided that I wanted us to have a home that we could call ours forever. And so we started the hunt for one we could afford. And wow, was that a sobering punch to the stomach. Turns out our measly double minimum wage annual income could not afford us an awful lot. Seriously, some of the properties that we saw were genuinely diabolical, and that's not me being snobby. One of the houses we visited had blood splatters on the upstairs mirror. And another one, when I asked the estate agent, where's the washing machine or where would the washing machine go? They suggested walking 15 minutes to a laundrette. I don't think so. But one of my personal favourites is when we visited a house that was teeny weeny. It was so ridiculously small and it was all dishevelled and it was just really unkempt. And we walked through it and we walked through the kitchen that just needed an entire new renovation into this little astroturf garden. And the estate agent turned to me and said, and there's a tree? This woman really be out here trying to sell me this house because of a tree. Yeah, I forget the fact that the garden was the same level as a car park with no privacy, but hey. We've got a tree. And after several houses where the neighbour's garden featured a burnt sofa, cars stacked on bricks, box bedrooms and zero original features, we were pretty despondent. And then my beautiful Nan did what she does best. She offered an interfering comment that ended up changing our lives forever. Well, you know Rosa from church. She's selling her house. Now the area where Rosa, the lady that we knew from church, lived had a varying reputation and so my mum wasn't originally very keen on seeing it and let's face it, we'd been burnt so many times I don't think we could take another heartbreak. But we were driving past the area late one night and I happened to see the house and I instantly knew we needed a viewing. The entire look of the house and the row of houses that surrounded it were just so quaint. They were like little chocolate box houses. They were just, they were lovely. They were so gorgeous and they looked pretty untouched. And for me, that gets me pretty excited. And so we booked a viewing and there it sat a delightful 1920s property in a row of identical houses, all with a sweet little star carved on the top and coin either side. And what I loved about them is that there were only about six properties in this style and they all sloped down a little hill. Yes, okay, we were still in the middle of the inner city, but you actually find that in the city, there's a lot of period properties that really haven't been tampered with that much. And this one 
it just spoke to me. I cannot get the lighting right today because the sun is like blaring. Anyway, so we walked in and there was our gorgeous Rosa, an Italian lady in her mid 90s who'd been living in the house for the last 15 years or so. But what we didn't find was the estate agent. And yet there was a load of unaccompanied buyers just traipsing around Rosa's home and she was pretty concerned about it and we were pretty angry. They were just wandering around upstairs and Rosa couldn't even get upstairs anymore so she must have felt just so vulnerable in that moment. So we gave her a big hug and said that we wouldn't leave until we saw this estate agent with the whites of our own eyes. Long story short, the estate agent apologised, the rest of the buyers left and me and my mum were finally able to walk around this slightly dated, slightly dilapidated home that was desperate for some TLC. And that's nothing on Rosa. She absolutely adored this house. It's just that over the years, she hasn't been able to keep up with the upkeep. And then we put an offer in, which was way below the asking price because it was literally all that we could afford. And we tried not to get our hopes up too much because we just figured we were going to be outbid. And then at the time I was working at a hotel and I received a phone call from the estate agent to say that Rosa had accepted our offer. I literally had to ask her to repeat herself because I so didn't believe it. And yes, it's probably because Rosa knew us, but it's also because she wanted this home to go to a proper family. And that's what she told the estate agent. And me and my mum are a family. And so Finally, we had our forever home. But let me tell you, it wasn't all sunshine and roses because when we went back to the house, the amount of work that it needed was kind of overwhelming. And although we had the help of family and friends, we just kind of decorated it to make it livable. And I think we were still, we had our rental brains on. So we weren't truly putting our stamp on it because we just weren't used to that feeling of freedom. And so for a while, it was decorated, but just not to our taste. And for a couple of years, it stayed that way because of budget, time, and life in general. And at one point, we were even considering moving. And in hindsight, that's because there were a lot of things going on in our lives that were just so out of our control and were incredibly difficult. And so I think we got it into our heads that a change of scenery would solve all of our problems. FYI, it wouldn't have. And after lots of discussion, we finally decided to turn this house into our dream home. Yay! And that all began with the kitchen. We designed this kitchen with literally nobody else in mind. And that was so freeing. It was a vintage 1940s-esque cottage-like grandma kitchen. Um, duck egg blue, mint green colour scheme, black and white floors, revamping the old pantry, and enlisting the help of a friend who had never renovated a kitchen in his life. Apparently we love a challenge. And this is a piece of advice I'd give to anybody, whether you have a mortgage or are renting, don't design your home with anybody else in mind other than yourself. And I know in rental properties, there has to be limits, but there is something so joyous about living authentically you, and you should be allowed to do that in your home. And obviously, if you're flipping properties and you want to sell your home one day, you have to make it profitable, you have to make it sellable, it's got to be a bit of a blank canvas so people can envisage their own tastes. But if you have no plans to go anywhere, then let your hair down and make it somewhere that feels quintessentially you. Cute, right? But that was nothing. No, what really set us off is the purchasing of this original late 1940s gas cooker who we named Glenda, which we got for an absolute steal on eBay for £16. Basically, it used to belong to the eBay seller's father who no longer needed it, and so she was selling it. So we took a journey to Liverpool, which is kind of a way away from where we are, to go and pick her up, not knowing if she'd work or not, because she hadn't been used in many a year, and I think she'd been sat in a garage, and we brought her all the way home. We employed a gas fitter to come and look at her, and we kept everything crossed. Would you believe, after decades of not being used, all she needed was a new gas pipe, and she was as good as new. Plus a little bit of light refurbishment here and there. And when we installed her and started using her in our kitchen, that she went so well in, by the way, it kind of just open the doors for us to turn our entire house into a vintage paradise. And then we really couldn't stop. 
And it was in the living room that we discovered our first original feature when one Saturday afternoon we decided to tear up the laminate floors to find gorgeous original floorboards with a lovely stencil pattern going all the way around the room. I still don't know what era that's from. If anybody knows, drop a comment because it's also in the upstairs bedroom too. I don't know why I'm pointing up. I am in the upstairs bedroom. And we spent tireless hours treating the floor, bringing everything back to the original wood, re-wallpapering. We installed a log burner to enhance the room's traditional look. And we replaced the original stained glass for double glazing, but kept the original pattern and of course, repurpose the original. And yes, we kept our ceiling rose, even though it's off centre. And well done to everybody in the comments of my video, a tour of my 1940s inspired house, who answered my question correctly. Why is a ceiling rose always off centre? Well, it's so that the light doesn't cast a shadow on the occupants inside, so that people outside can't see you getting undressed or getting up to anything else. Now in the living room, we were going very Victorian parlor room meets grandma core. So we had a bunch of old suitcases, we had tasseled lampshades, we had our old bookshelf. The whole room was kind of a warm purpley tone. And it's just one of those spaces that you walk into and you really could be anywhere. That sounds so cliche, but you know what I mean. But my favorite thing about the living room is our ability to pattern clash because there are a lot of patterns going on in that living room, but somehow it works. Like both the charity shop bought sofas have different patterns. The wallpaper has a different pattern. The big rug on the floor has a different pattern. And yet when you pull it all together, it just, it still creates a harmony or it does in my humble opinion. And I think that mismatch feel is something that we quite like because it has a vintage twist and again, echoes an eclectic mix of eras all the way from the Victorian era to the 1940s. It's art deco, it's a bit unique and it's a feature room. So if you wanted my blessing to pattern clash, I give it to you. Now onto our stairs. We had wooden stairs, which we absolutely loved, and we knew we wanted a 1940 stair runner. Well, I say that, it was actually my nan that spotted a runner in a carpet shop and gave us the idea. Cheers, nan. But these stairs. Not only was painting them an absolute nightmare, but installing a stair runner on stairs that go round a corner tests your patience in ways you never thought possible. But let's be fair. It was totally worth it. And people have asked us how we got the carpet so tight to the stairs. Uh, basically, it was a very thin carpet, still durable, but thin. And we just use a staple gun and many, many hours of our life. It's not a quick job, but it's a rewarding one. And then after this, we started to use the stairs as a kind of gallery, because if there's one thing that this house has too many of, it is vintage paintings. We love our artwork in this house. And because our house isn't very large, we were worried we'd run out of room, but by using the stairs as a kind of gallery, we've got ample room to fill it with beautiful pieces, which we've already filled. And then at the top of the stairs, you've got the original sash window, which of course, knowing us, was going absolutely nowhere. In the two top bedrooms, we wanted them to feel very feminine and very calming. And so there's again, a lot of pattern clashing and there's also deep colors like greens or you know patterned wallpaper, which I would say, don't be afraid to use because I think people sometimes assume that to make a space calm, it has to be neutral. I don't think it does. And although there might be a lot going on in the rooms in our house, everything is still very organized. Everything has its place. And I still walk in and feel instantly relaxed. And I've spoke about this before, but I think it's a real neat trick. My original 1920s cast iron fireplace, um, we decided to kind of revamp it. So we didn't want to pay for um, a chimney sweep of the chimney breast. Instead, we use an ethanol fire, which is kind of the environment and it still gives that real ornate look, which is what I'm after, and does emit heat, which we definitely don't need today. And in my room, you've also got my gorgeous antique bed from 1890, which was 150 pounds on eBay. And although all of this did have to be done on a budget, we're not buying secondhand because of that. We actually really enjoy pre-loved items because we like things that have a sense of story and a sense of character and a sense of history. I don't know why, we just always have. It's got a lot to do with my grandpa, I think. And so buying 
pre-loved is always the way we wanted to do it. Okay, on to the bathroom. So by this point, we were really embracing the 1940s feel, as you can see, because we went for a traditional lemon yellow, which was a common colour for bathrooms in the 40s, that or a kind of light green. Um, the Mallard ducks are featuring in this room, of course. Uh, we painted our bath panel black because, as I said, this is all done on a budget, so we couldn't change our actual appliances I wish we could have because I would have loved a system pool chain toilet but we just worked with what we had and again created a space that isn't to everybody's taste but it's certainly to ours and like I said before we're designing this house with us in mind and nobody else. And we didn't even leave out our sweet very little hallway with vintage wallpaper which again we got on eBay, pheasant wall hangings so when you enter our home it really does feel like you've taken a step into history, I guess. Or in some people's eyes, a place where your grandma might live or where a charity shop has thrown up on. And we also wanted our garden to feel like a haven. So we repurposed the original cast iron gate, but we just moved it and we installed a wooden gate at the front of the house to give us a bit more privacy. Uh, we built our own allotments. Uh, we repurposed our outhouse to be like a little nooky place where you could sit and have a cup of tea and all our gardening stuff's in there. I built an aviary for my pigeons, of course, and... Yeah, we kind of call it the Wallace and Gromit garden. It's by no means a massive space, but again, it really does feel like our own little sanctuary. So how did we pay this house off in eight years? Well, rewinding back to 2016, we put down a laughable deposit of just under five grand because that was literally all we could afford. And we purchased the house for 83,000, which again, like I said, was under the asking price because they asked for about 92,000, I think, and we could only offer tip top level 83,000. And thanks to Rosa, we got it. And then what would happen is we'd get into a fixed term contract for two years. And then every two years, we would move mortgage providers and tell the provider that we wanted to knock years off our mortgage. In doing that, it does mean that you're overpaying every month. So let's say we could have got away with paying 450 a month, we'd instead dig deep and we'd pay 750 a month. And also with mortgages, you usually get an allowance every year or two years where you can overpay. It's only an allowance, so you can't just overpay loads. You have to stay within the limit. And so whenever we had a bit of spare cash, we would try and overpay. And literally every two years, we would do this without fail. Find a new mortgage provider, say we wanted to pay more off, and it would go on and on and on. And slowly but surely, we were getting the mortgage down and down and down and down. So if we had 25 years left, we'd say to them, we want to shave it off to 18 years. From 18 years, we want to shave off to 13 years, and so on and so on. And this is all because of my mum like she is so savvy with money I have learned so much since buying this house and even though it would usually be me putting a bigger lump sum down on the mortgage or sorting out the original deposit or paying off the very last bit of the mortgage because I am in a job where thankfully I earn a bit more money than her and I'm not on minimum wage which I'm very very grateful for it was all of her organisation and speaking to a new mortgage provider every two years without fail that got us to this point. Until it came to July 31st of this year when we just had one more lump sum to pay and the house was ours. So I put the biggest lump sum down because I'm a saver. I always have been. I think it's a lot to do with my upbringing and also buying secondhand a lot. I don't spend a lot on clothes really or much of anything. I kind of just use things till the nth degree. Um, I don't waste. Um, I'm, I'm not like ridiculously frugal. I will, I will spend, I will treat myself, but I've always liked to keep a kitty for a rainy day. So with my savviness for saving combined with my mum's expertise in being able to speak to mortgage advisors every two years, it finally came to the final day and I put a big lump sum of money on the mortgage and my mum helped where she could and we just threw everything we had at it until we got that glorious email to say that we owned the house. Now of course that won't work for everyone because it all depends on the size of the property you're buying and the size of the mortgage. This little house is just that, it's little and it wasn't very much money. Like, I'm sure there might be some people watching this from around the world who are like, 83,000? How the hell did you get a house of that price? But it's all to do with the area that it's in 
and you know like I say the fact that it's semi-detached and um I don't know me and my mum just saw potential in her and I don't know if we'll stay here forever to be honest I don't know how we'll ever part with her but all of the stars aligned and we were able to buy this house right when we needed to and with a lot of hard work like me and my mum we do not come from privilege at all this has all come off our own back through a lot of hard work we've managed to do it but it won't work for everybody because like I say where you are in the country the size of the house you buy the size of the mortgage you buy the if you live on your own if you live with people who can contribute they are all factors into how long it will take you to pay off a mortgage including what you do for a living and the wage you earn and let's face it in a cost of living crisis it has become more difficult than ever to be a homeowner and I think if even one thing was different in my circumstance I wouldn't be one right now and it's also important to say that me and my mum were never given a handout we didn't have any money lent to us we didn't have any inheritance that we drew upon this was all from our hard-earned savings and a lot of intrinsic planning and just remember this isn't a how to pay off your mortgage this is just a here's my story of how I paid off my mortgage because I'm not a gatekeeper and I see a lot of videos online where it's like oh we bought an 18th century manor house and you know I'm 26 and my boyfriend's 27 and people are there in the comments like how did you manage to do that and these influencers these content creators who are making so much content about their house and probably earning a lot of money through their content to help do up their house or pay off their mortgage never speak about how they were actually able to buy that property. I'm right there with you. I'm looking at these people buying these detached period homes at a ridiculously young age and being like, but how? And so I just wanted to come clean and say that this is how we did it. And it won't work for everybody. I know that. It's very circumstantial. And this house is by no means a manor house. This isn't a palace, but it's our home. So whether we inspire people to know that it is possible to pay off a mortgage in 2024, I don't know. But what I hope we do is inspire people to decorate their home just for them, no matter what other people think. Because I promise you, once you embrace your you-ness and make your home the sanctuary that you deserve, it will change your life.